Brick Films, one of the early staples of internet culture. Actually, that's not even the entire story. Brick Films predate the internet, and certainly YouTube by several years, but I would argue they really hit their stride in the mid to late 2000s and early 2010s, following an explosion of LEGO-based stop-motion animation videos, some of which were enormously successful and actually launched careers, while others were not as popular. Regardless, these videos, no matter how crude, actually served as kind of good motivation for me as a kid watching YouTube back in the day, as many of them were made by people not much older than I was at the time, and they were actually taking off and becoming incredibly popular and beloved by a large number of people. It made me, as well as many others I'd imagine, think, hey, if this bored kid in their bedroom can make something that actually gets them positive attention, maybe I can too. Of course, many of the Brick films I watched as a kid were the popular ones that everybody seems to hold in pretty high regard. The Forest Fire Lego Batman videos need no introduction. I loved those videos back then, and even nowadays, I still think they hold up pretty well. There's also, of course, the Battle of the Brick short film, a huge, lavish production, by Lego stop motion standards anyway, that still holds up incredibly well over a decade after its initial release. But that's not what I want to focus on today. Instead, I'd like to turn my attention to something a little more quaint. Lego Dinosaur Animations. Now, as I've stated several times in the past, I am a huge dinosaur fan. I even have an entire playlist dedicated to videos I've made that relate to them, but my current love for them has nothing on how much of a nerd I was about them when I was like, eight years old. It was kind of scary looking back, let's just put it that way, and of course I was always on the lookout for new things to watch, as I stated in my Dinosaur King review. Thank you for over a thousand views on that by the way, my goodness. Anyway, in addition to that show, one other genre I frequented was Lego dinosaur animations, a handful of which I'm going to be going over today. Obviously all of these videos are quite old, and I'm sure they do not reflect the creator's current standard of work assuming they still make these videos, which they probably don't since a lot of these appear to be dead channels. I'm not trying to hate on anybody or shame people for making subpar dinosaur animations when they were kids. Honestly, I commend them for the fact that they were even able to make something that they were proud enough to think it was worth posting online at all, so just be aware that this is all for goofs and gaffs. We begin simply enough with LEGO Jurassic Park, uploaded by the channel LEGO Head Bond back in August of 2009. I don't think the story for this one needs any lengthy dissection, it's just a LEGO-fied version of the first Jurassic Park film, but streamlined to fit a 10 minute runtime. It includes most of the major beats from the film, but there are certain changes that stand out. For one thing, they cut out the sick Triceratops scene. I don't really know why, it's not as if there weren't LEGO Triceratops figures even back when this was released. I guess visionary filmmaker Jack Bond just didn't have access to it. Regardless, this means that in this version, there's no good reason for Ellie not to accompany the others on the tour, so she just inexplicably goes back with Hammond. I also don't recall Tim having stubble in the original film, or wearing a red bandana for that matter, but eh, barely any of the clothes match up to the film version, so it's not a big deal, I suppose. The dinosaur models for this animation are a bit all over the place, with many of them being portrayed by LEGO Dino Attack models, which are super exaggerated and only really fit in with that line and that story, so seeing them here, especially contrasted with the older dinosaur models from like the Studio series or the Adventurers line, is kind of odd. Honestly, it's not a big deal, it's just something that stood out to me watching this again. The animation is a little inconsistent in quality, with some parts really impressing me due to them seemingly including motion blur, which is super high tech for an amateur LEGO animation from the late 2000s, but for every moment like that, you have one where an animator's hand or finger is visible for a few frames. A shame auteur legend Jack Bond didn't catch these grievous errors. As for the audio, it's a lot of stock or stolen sound effects, including this jungle ambient sound that I've heard before and so have you. I don't know where it comes from, please tell me, here it is. Of course, we have lots of sounds from the movie itself, mostly roars, but also lines of dialogue and music cues, all of which just sound like acclaimed director Jack Bond put his crappy camcorder microphone up close to his TV and recorded it from there. 
truly innovative. By the way, before I wrap this up, I want to take the time to mention that while this is a LEGO animation, it wasn't entirely achieved via bricks. A handful of wide shots are shown, which are clearly drawn in Microsoft Paint, most likely courtesy of skilled artist and matte painter, Jack Bond. Alright, jokes aside, I get enjoyment out of this animation, and since it was one of the first I ever saw, I have a lot of personal nostalgia for it. But fear not, ladies, gentlemen, etc., for the best, or rather funniest, is yet to come. Next, we have LEGO Dino Attack, also from 2009, and incidentally, the second brick film in this collection to be based on something else. In this case, it's the LEGO Dino Attack line from the mid-2000s, a crazy-ass line featuring mutant, souped-up dinosaurs in a post-apocalyptic wasteland getting blown away by generic, tough mercenary guys, all of which is represented pretty well in this short for better or for worse. Unlike the last film, in which man of few words Jack Bond refused to do any voice acting and instead used sound bites from the movie, this guy, uh, Lyle, did lend his voice to the production. Based on his soothing, dulcet tones, he's probably 13 at the oldest, which is terrifying to think about the fact that he's probably pushing 30 at this point if that's the case, but hey. We all gotta grow up. By the way, it's not just his voice that clues me into his age, his taste in music also reflects that. He actually uses the song Blow Me Away from Halo 2 in this video, and also included one censored swear word, so clearly this guy knows what's cool. Speaking of music though, while LEGO Jurassic Park was mostly music-less with some occasional excerpts from the movie, this one features lots of music and, with little exception, it's all free stock iMovie music, which is the best music to feature in your action-packed dinosaur romp. While we're on the audio, I love these footstep sounds used throughout the short, they're just kind of funny. As for the roars, many of them reuse Jurassic Park sounds, as expected, but there is a special guest vocalist present here. Yes, your ears do not deceive you. That is in fact Godzilla's roar emitting from that pterosaur. Even when I'm trying to make a video about something else, I can't escape him. The animation in this one is a little more janky than we saw before. The movement can be a bit stiff at times, and it's overall less polished than good old Johnny Bond's work on the previous brick film. The set is pretty impressive though, as it really does look like a destroyed city and manages to actually look quite a bit larger in places than it probably was. Here are some other quirks about the animation. In the opening scene, one of the characters has a little gearing up montage, which by the way, this film has a lot of gearing up montages, and during said sequence, he's supposed to be putting on a red bandana. Okay, how are we supposed to depict that? Well, Lyle had the minifigure hold up a red stud to his face, and then have it jump cut to a different head with the bandana. When I first watched this, I had no idea what I was looking at, so I initially interpreted it as him literally putting on his angry face. Because, look, see how his expression changes? I saw him holding a red Lego piece, red, angry, right? I see him hold it up to his head, that's... That's just how I interpreted that sequence. Anyway, the film ends with a reporter showing up to question the members of the team, which is pretty much the first real introduction we get to any of these characters, by the way, and it's all within the last minute. Anyway, they all give their spiels, and then the short ends with this. So one more question. If you can think of something more annoying than having to fight dinosaurs for days on end, what would it be? Reporters. Um... Zing? Like the last one, this video is entertaining, though mostly for ironic reasons. If you watched it a lot as a kid, like I did, and want some of those memories, I'll link the video in the description, as I'm doing for all of these videos. If you didn't see it when it was relevant and are just in it for morbid curiosity, I'd still say go check it out. Now, I know what some of you are immediately thinking with this one. Enemy, you stupid bitch. Are you really so brain dead that you can't even count? Two comes after one, you idiot. So why are you including part two in this, but not part one? Well, first of all, rude. Second, watch this one first. That's the one that I've watched a lot more, so it's going in this video, and the first one 
is not. It's kind of confusing how both of these videos are split into multiple parts, meaning we have Dino Disaster 1 Part 2, not to be confused with Dino Disaster 2 Part 1, though maybe confusion is the right thing to be feeling, as that was my main state while watching this. Yeah, so far all the animations we've seen were based on pre-existing material, and thus had some conception of what a plot was. Dino Disaster 2 is here to show us what happens when one of these productions gets a little ambitious and tries to craft its own original story. It forgets to have one. The best I can gather is there's a bunch of dinosaurs rampaging through a city literally called Crazy Town. Yeah, we'll get to that. Meanwhile, a bunch of mega blocks are also making their way towards Crazy Town, and it's up to the inhabitants to fend them off. So, in theory, there actually is some sort of through line, but in execution it comes across as a bunch of unrelated, nearly incomprehensible vignettes of random characters doing random things just for randomness sake. I think a big problem with this one is that it's trying to be a little more tongue-in-cheek than the previous two animations in this video. Those seem to be done in 100% earnestness and took themselves seriously, making it much funnier when you actually watch them. On the other hand, this one doesn't play itself as straight and is obviously trying to be more comedically motivated than the others. And a lot of the humor just isn't that funny. Like one of the jokes here is where Harry Potter in a dinosaur robot or whatever shows up to fight the T-Rex. Get it? It's weird and random, which means it's funny! Eh, I mean, I guess, but that tends to be more of a correlation, not causation thing, you know what I mean? Now, there are some bits where the nonsensical humor was actually kind of chuckle-worthy, but a lot of the runtime is taken up by the creators doing goofy character voices, which makes me question who the target audience for this was. Now, without being too mean, I will say some moments of unintended humor land much better than the parts meant to be funny, which is better than nothing. Probably the most noteworthy example in this category is the sound of the T-Rex. Remember how the previous two shorts used sounds from other dinosaur media for their creatures? Well, the minds behind Dino Disaster 2 decided they were better than that, and so gave us... this. <laughs> This isn't just funny because it's clearly a little kid and probably one of the animator's younger siblings making a roaring sound into the microphone. There are actually many different levels to this masturbatory glory of auditory that make it simply magnificent. Firstly, I love how half-hearted the kid sounds about making the roaring sound. It's like even he didn't care about making this. Second, I would of course be remiss if I didn't mention the audible microphone peaking in this audio. That's when you get really close to the microphone and it makes all those obnoxious popping sounds with yeah, yeah, that's what that is. And finally, the cherry on top is the fact that rather than recording a few different roars that they could switch between, they instead elected to use this same one over <laughs> and over <laughs> and over <laughs> and fucking over again so many times. Sadly, that's about the best thing in this video. The animation here is particularly choppy shit. I know I shouldn't be too hard here, but I've seen better from videos several years older made by people several years younger. The humor isn't funny, the animation and set pieces aren't impressive, and the constant droning T-Rex sound will probably send you into a coma by the end. I'd say only watch this one for nostalgia, otherwise stay away. I will say though, it is a little interesting how this video shows dinosaurs attacking a city rather than being on an island or the film taking place after the city has already been destroyed. I just wish this idea came in a better form than this. Okay, I don't want to get anyone's hopes up, but this might be the best animation I feature in this whole video, as well as possibly the greatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I watched it when I was a kid like I did with all these animations, but I did not give it enough credit at the time for being the ironic masterpiece it very much is. It's to the point where I really think the only way I can at least somewhat communicate its sheer brilliance is to go through it scene by scene. So let's do it! Right off the bat, we can see that instead of coming from artistic powerhouse Jack Bond or some kid in his bedroom Lyle, this picture comes from blockbuster legends Ole and Ludwig, 
proving that this production was so epic that it took the input of two creative geniuses to bring it to life. You can also, like with Dino Disaster 2, tell that this video was uploaded a little later than the other ones, as while the camera it was recorded on is still in 4x3, the actual uploaded video itself is in 16x9. For this caliber of filmmaking, I honestly think it deserved the anamorphic treatment, but hey, that's just me. Anyway, the short begins with our main character... I don't think they ever actually name him, so I'm just gonna call him Ole. Arriving at his boss's office to show him his new DNA sample, or sample as he calls it here. I'm pretty sure these guys are based out of Sweden, so I guess that explains why. Anyway, the boss doesn't seem all that impressed with Ole's sample, and his two goons slash random construction worker minifigures escort him out as they smash it. On his way home, Ole is hit up by his friend, who asks him if he's going to the Dino Island, like it's just a casual vacation spot or something. I guess the implication is that Ole and the other members are VIPs that were given special access to the island, but I'm clearly reaching here, and I seriously doubt renowned action directors Ole and Ludwig thought that hard about it. So they arrive at the helipad, and the pilot utters this perplexing phrase. Come people, my owner told me to get you to his island. Really? Owner? Not boss? Or employer? Or supervisor? Owner? What was that just the first thing that popped into your head? If so, that does not bode well. By the way, you can pretty immediately tell that the animation here is just the jankiest of the jank. There's a lot of repeated animation and certain motions don't match the character's dialogue properly. I expected more from prepubescent Swedish kids, I'll be totally honest. The editing on this is also really choppy, with certain shots flying by way too quickly, and the shaky, unstable camera movements combined with the quick cutting means that the whole film can be kinda disorienting at times. Anyway, the folks make it to the island where they meet Doctor... just... just Doctor. He doesn't get a name, none of the characters do. We at least get our first look at the dinosaurs, and other assorted prehistoric animals, pretty early on when a pteranodon pops up, and yeah, like with Dino Disaster, the two little tykes behind this one thought they could make dinosaurs too. <coughs> Whoa. Whoa. Luckily, the pterosaur is shot down, but because this short is only seven minutes long, we can't wait too long between dinosaur encounters, so almost immediately, we see a velociraptor being monitored by some hunters. So after this genius comedy, One of the hunters tries to go after the raptor, with predictable results. This is probably a good time to mention that this is easily the goriest of the four films we've seen. The other ones weren't big on too much bloodshed, but this one... No, no, there's there's red clay everywhere. It's an absolute bloodbath. Instant R rating. They eventually catch the raptor and... Uh, um, sir, I think your head is on backwards and... You obviously seem quite worried about that yourself, so I guess you didn't need me telling that, did you? Back with the VIPs, the doctor, or general, or whoever this guy is, sits down and decides to tell his guests why he brought them here. Let's see what he says. Just this island made it out of the Jurassic Age, so the dinosaurs on this island survived all the time. And now we got here and making, like, nuclear bombs out of their blood. Excuse me, why? Okay, so completely asinine reason for bringing the dinosaurs back aside, I will compliment this film for having some subtle details. Like right here, when they move out one of the velociraptors, and while they're preparing to transport it, the other one is seen in the background still moving around a bit. That's a cool little detail that didn't need to be included but was anyway. I like those. So anyway, we now get the immense pleasure of watching this raptor get gunned down by a firing squad. Really? You couldn't have just euthanized it? Wouldn't that have been easier? Unfortunately, when they tried to do the same with the T-Rex, yeah, the silent has a T-Rex, go figure, it doesn't seem to work, and, you know, I know deep down there's nothing that can top Dino Disaster's T-Rex roar. Oh boy, did these kids ever try! Wow, horrific. I'm gonna be sleeping with one eye open after I hear that. Not like the Dino Disaster T-Rex, that one's actually terrifying. I don't know who did the roar for that, but whoever they are, I don't want to meet them. So the T-Rex starts wreaking havoc, all the dinosaurs inexplicably escape from their pens, and pretty soon it's chaos on Dinosaur Island. Even the doctor gets taken out by the T-Rex and... Okay, one hell of a gruesome death aside, did the T-Rex actually eat him? 
Seems to me like all of his flesh and entire skeleton fell onto the ground after the T-Rex picked him up in his mouth. Maybe the T-Rex was actually full and just decided to spit the dude out instead of swallowing him, but in the time it took to have that revelation, it had already crunched him up into minced meat. So the last two and a half minutes of the short are pretty much one big non-stop action scene with the dinosaurs tearing shit up around the island, when a boat arrives telling the survivors it's going to be transporting the T-Rex. They trank the dinosaur and then... Bring it back to civilization? Yeah, here's where you can tell that the plot to this short, if you can even call it that, is just an amalgamation of the plots of the first and second Jurassic Park films, but with slight differences to make it seem like that's not the case. Like with the reason for the dinosaurs being captured being to extract their blood rather than open a theme park, but that doesn't really make sense when you still have them bring the T-Rex back. Why did they do that in this version? Shits and giggles? Whatever. So the T-Rex breaks loose and starts eating people, predictably, but Ole has a plan. And it involves breaking into his former boss's office, asking him for a bazooka, and when that doesn't work, assaulting one of his boss's goons, murdering the other and his boss in cold blood, stealing the bazooka, and finally using that to blow the T-Rex's head off. Also, I have no idea why, for the last act of this performance, the blood changes from red clay or putty to just being red Lego pieces. It doesn't matter, it's almost over. And this epic concludes with an interview with one of the survivors, John Johnson. Yeah, that's his name. And you know what's even more depressing? That's the only name any character gets in this thing. That's as far as they got. John Johnson. Well, anyway, John Johnson informs us that we should just let the dinosaurs be, and that if we do, you guessed it, life will find a way. And boy did it ever, as the T-Rex somehow managed to reattach its head and swim back to the island afterwards. If that's not life finding a way, I don't know what is. And then the animation ends with the T-Rex voring the audience, and the credits rolling with music that sounds like a 70s news broadcast. What a journey that was, am I right? So yeah, hopefully now you understand the differences between a good bad Lego dinosaur animation and a bad bad Lego dinosaur animation. This short film is shoddy, it's clueless, it's derivative, and it's absolutely glorious. I could watch it a hundred times and never get bored. Part of me wishes it was longer, but at the same time I liked that it was so incredibly fast paced and just in and out like that. It added to the charm. Plus, I can always check out the sequels if I ever want more of this. Yeah, did I mention there are sequels? You know what? What the hell, let's speedrun those two while we're at it. The second one of these is kind of awful. The animation is better, significantly better, actually. There's more than one voice actor. They opted to just use actual dinosaur sounds from other media rather than try and make their own. And they added lip flaps to the characters when they speak. Overall, it's a more polished and better put together piece, but it doesn't have nearly the same charm as the first, and at two and a half minutes, it's way too short and slapdash to really say anything about. Part 3 is a lot more impressive on a technical level than the previous two. The animation is more fluid, the lighting is much more atmospheric, and the audio and video editing is leagues ahead of what came before. Plus, remember that joke I made about the first part, and how it should have been presented in anamorphic? Well, this one actually is. You'd probably think this would be the best, but you'd be wrong. One fatal flaw ruins the whole thing. It wasn't finished. These goobers released a half-complete work because they threw up their hands and quit halfway through production, which took five years, by the way. So yeah, I'd like to call this the best one, but it's not. It's the worst by far, simply by virtue of being incomplete. What a sour note to end on. Ole, Ludwig, wherever you are now, I sincerely hope you have moved on to better things and are living your best life. My anger is completely fabricated. Oh well, at least I could check out the original anytime, along with all the other dinosaur brick films featured in this video. I hope you enjoy this look back on days long since past and found it an interesting glimpse into just what YouTube was like in the late 2000s. It says a lot that these films, despite their obvious shortcomings, still racked up millions of views showing that they really struck a chord with people one way or another. While some will say that these are only worth looking at for sentimentality's sake, I still say if you're even the slightest bit curious, it might be worth giving one of these a watch. If nothing else, you might get some good ironic entertainment out of it. Thank you for watching, have a great day, and until next time, see ya.